Well, hello there, and welcome to Criminals and Phantoms. You like that sound? You like I, I got that really was good. That was really good. See, good. Yeah, I hit the post and everything. <laughs> Landon will be real proud because I hit the post. Uh, so <laughs> Landon last week and put up a a big deal. Oh, we need to get music. The people <laughs> listen to the music. I said, what the fuck are we doing? He, and now and this, here's the thing. This still isn't good enough for him because he means like he wants me to go get an actual produced intro why what is this? This, this this is a joke we do a joke here sonia did you have a good week i did how about you it, it, today is my mommy's birthday happy and birthday to her <laughs> thank you happy birthday mommy we had such a lovely day and i'm the, i'm done with the music i'm done it's a i'm done with it. it's <laughs> so we had such a good day and and i'm and i'm glad uh, I'm glad we had a good day. I'm glad you had a good week, Sonia. Uh, something not so good is this topic that we're going to discuss because, man, is this a bit of a bummer. Sonia, I know that uh, we were sort of last minute on this one, that uh, we were we were pretty busy people. And uh, no Landon this week because Landon is out on a job slacking traveling <laughs> he's traveling yes yeah. landon you guys have heard landon landon has to travel a lot for his job so some shows he misses and that's just because his job is very uh hands-on he, he's needed um maybe if we're lucky every once in a while he'll hop into the comments very briefly uh just to talk shit so maybe if we're lucky um landon will make a brief appearance but uh as you guys can tell by the title right we are talking about the vampire king of fresno um marcus wesson and sonia there was something that i found very interesting about doing all this because he's titled the vampire king but there's very little vampire <laughs> involved yeah. in this story Not there's a lot of blood <laughs> yeah there, uh, i don't really get it i guess uh, no i do involved <laughs> well, well we'll talk about we'll talk about what that what that means in a little bit like why he was why he thought he was a vampire but really he was just a crazy he was just a crazy person um so let's let's get into it Do you, are you ready sonia yes. all righty oh <laughs> wow she's now she's now forcing me she's telling me how to do my show she says go she's annoyed by my two minute intro now i'm just gonna keep talking uh no marcus wesson was described as being a very shy and gentle uh child um he was apparently very quiet and he grew up in sort of a strange religion um as a matter of fact i don't i don't have written down the name of the religion but i should something seventh something something anywho uh, the point of the religion is basically uh, it flips religion on its head. They they believe that the Sabbath is on Saturday and not Sunday. And there's a lot of weird sort of cookie, kookiness to the religion um, that he was raised up in. Uh, it's the same religion that the Branch Davidians would later uh, sort of adopt from. So um, after this time period, right, where he was, you know, a young person uh, he would grow into a young man who had a fixation with animals. He was said to be something of an animal healer. Um, there's a story that I think his sister had told about how when they were kids, there was a dead dog that they had found and he had taken care of the dog. And it turns out the dog wasn't dead because he could hear the heartbeat, even though it was very slow. And like two days later, he would nurse uh, the dog back to uh, recovery. So, Sonia, when you when you do read a story like this, right, and you see mm -hmm. that someone sort of has something that may sort of parallel something with you, do you sort of reflect on yourself and go, man, where did they go wrong? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, do you start yeah. with decisions that like, you what just made? happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, he would later go on to become a medic in Vietnam, and uh, his time period there like isn't discussed much. Uh, he drove an ambulance is pretty much the only information that I was able to discern. Um, he would return home and he would begin dating a married but separated woman um, named Rosemary. I'm going to try this name. God have mercy. Magatoriania. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, there's, let's, let's go with that. <laughs> there's too many letters in this name, right? 
Um, but but he would have ulterior motives quickly into the relationship because he was more interested in her daughter, who was eight years old. Sonia, yeah. is that a red flag for you? Mm -hmm. I don't. That's that's the first major red like, flag. Get out. <laughs> that's get out the my house. <laughs> That's what a normal person would say. A normal person would say, okay, that we're done. This is over. I'm going to report you. Yeah. Rosemary was on board and allowed Marcus to pursue her child daughter. And by the time uh, Elizabeth, uh, who was the daughter, was, I think, 15 she would have her own child with Marcus. This is also while Rosemary was also pumping out Marcus's children. Wow. What a already, right? This is the infancy of this cult, of this family, of whatever you want to call it. And man, it's already super dark. And it only gets worse. Right. Um so once again, he would marry Elizabeth in a private ceremony that he held himself at the home. Um, once again, Rosemary had other children from a previous marriage. Um, and Marcus would move in, and he would basically become king of shit. Uh, he would rule this house very strictly. Um, he was a very abusive person, verbally and physically. Uh, it was said that he had a bat uh, that was duct tape that he would beat people with. Um, and, and like, he wouldn't just beat them for like, oh, you snuck out late or, oh, you were like doing something like super terrible. One, one of these children got beaten because they took an extra scoop of peanut butter. These were the kinds of offenses, Sonia, that would deem, uh, Marcus to raise holy hell. So, um, they would have... Rosemary. Rosemary and Marcus would have nine total children that would survive birth. And at this point in time, Marcus decided he was still going to work. Uh, he was a banker for a short period of time. But as the children got older, he decided, nah, this isn't what God wants, because the man of the house shouldn't have to raise a finger. And so he would send Rosemary and his children, who were old enough to start working, to work. And they would. They would and collect a paycheck. He, and, he, and he would. He would go, and their paychecks were not their paychecks. They were to be given to him because his, his doctrine read that the man of the house is not supposed to work. The man of the house is to be provided for because I am the king, and it is God's will. This is, this is what he would say to these people, and they fucking bought it. And where did he read this kind of... Dumb rule. <laughs> he would he would go over this shit with the family. The, th this information comes from later when the family would be interviewed, and the family would the living members would talk about what he would say to them and how he would say it. And like there are certain how they things were too. that yeah, there were certain things that were absolutely drilled into their head that we'll get into more of those things a little bit later. So it's not like he had a written account of all these things like like David Koresh did. <laughs> he didn't have a written Bible, but basically it was he he was he, he would tell them that, it up. <laughs> well, he would <laughs> tell them. Longer. Yes, but he would tell them that he was communicating with God. So he would tell them that God was telling him this. And that's so yeah, they like believed it. God that. And they always do this shit, too. It's always, this is God's will. No, I don't. No. <laughs> so, um, once again, uh, he would, for a short period of time, also uh, be able to pick up uh, welfare benefits. But uh, he would be arrested a short time later for welfare fraud. In which, when he got out, um, he would build a camp, basically. Uh, they had no electricity, no running water. They literally, 16 people lived in a tent in the middle of the woods on a plot of land that he rented. But the issue is... They would be forced to leave when the 
owner of the property would pass away and his son would sell the land. So they were forced to leave. And once again, right, let's get into more of this shit. They had had to dumpster dive for food. They were all homeschooled, which it was described later that homeschooling was just him preaching the gospel of Marcus. <laughs> and No math or English involved. <laughs> yeah, they had a strict lifestyle to follow. He believed that incest was the way to create perfect man. So he would uh, sexually assault his own children as young as eight years old. And he would tell them that this is how a father would show love. And then he would marry them at 13. He would marry his own children. He would tell them that this is what fathers do, that we are creating a perfect man. And what he would do is, is he would tell them, we are vampires. And he would say Jesus was a vampire. That's why Jesus was able to be resurrected. And basically what he would say is, is that we are, in a sense, a part of God. We are descendants of God. And that's how he was able to sort of explain this shit to, to children. Um there were more rules, like as the boys were getting older, Marcus did not want the competition from his brother, cousin, uncle, sons. So he would tell them that they were not allowed to talk to the women. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a quote later uh, where he said, find your own women. <laughs> which is <laughs> Well, a... one of the boys were interested in one of the daughters. And that's where and that's it all where <laughs> it all started with the go the find jealousy. your own women. <laughs> but then if they found their own women, they would be shunned. Um, so once again, he would tell them that this is the way because God says so. And of course, they were children, so they bought it. Now, you may be asking yourself, what about the mother? What about Rosemary? Well, and at this care. point, at this point, Rosemary was very much still brainwashed. And unfortunately, Rosemary would pretty much always stay that way. Um, once again, um, this is where we learn about one of the other many tellings of Marcus. And this is where we first hear about a suicide pact. Uh, basically what Marcus had said is that if something ever goes south, we are all going to kill ourselves. We're going to kill the children and then we're going to kill ourselves. But I, Marcus, will be the only one to live because I have to tell the people what really happened. So Mark has basically <laughs> told his kids, you guys are all going to be the suckers who kill yourselves and take the rap. And I'm going to be the hero. Yeah, um, and who's going to believe him? <laughs> well, like you know, story. clearly, clearly God told him so. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can't be you can't be calling God a liar now, can you? Um, so once again, the property that they had been on, right, uh, the owner had died. Uh, so the crew were uprooted. They moved into a decaying tugboat in California, and at this point, one of the daughters, Ruby, would try to escape. Basically, uh, he at this point, once again, he would force them all to get jobs. He would force the kids to get jobs as soon as they could. Ruby began working at McDonald's, where her manager was a woman named Emma. And her and Emma were very close. And she would explain to Emma the situation, and Emma would say, like, hey, come stay with me. And so, unfortunately, right, Marcus was able to find her, and she went back without putting up a fight, uh, but he would torture her for 10 days, um, and he would force her to get a new job in a new town where she didn't know anybody. And this isn't the only time that Ruby would cause troubles. She would later cause problems with Rosemary. Now, at this point, Rosemary had made an ultimatum where she had said either you know, either you leave or I leave. That's how it's going to be. And Marcus had said, well, you can have your kids or you can have the van. And so she allowed Marcus to take the van and all of his kids. And she kept her kids. Realistically, she only kept like half, if that, <laughs> of the children. Most of them still ended up going with Marcus. Um, and so... Elizabeth, uh, Ruby would, would go to Rosemary, who was her mother, right? And she would say, Hey, like, I don't, I don't want to be doing this anymore. Like my mother is also my sister and, and I don't like this. And Rosemary would tell her quote, you made that choice. And so because Ruby had her own children with Marcus that she couldn't abandon, she returned again. 
man, this whole story, right, is a bummer for me, mainly because of the of the women who did like try to stand up and leave because each time they would return, it would get worse for them, as, as we'll see here in, in our next chapter. Well, Sonia the guy is bigger than them. I he mean, of course, he's stronger too, and he's and he's very influential to everyone else on camp. Like it takes a snap of his finger for him to say, "All right, you're 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 shunned now," and nobody else in camp is going to talk to these girls, right? Um. So, one night in 1998, uh, while Marcus was searching for Ruby. Uh, the crew members had noticed that there were some what they thought to be government trucks driving around. It turned out they were just progressive like insurance <laughs> vans. <laughs> and so th the crew, the crew is going to initiate Operation Everybody Dies on the boat. Uh, and they were going to initiate the pact suicide. But someone was smart enough to get in contact with Marcus, who responded by saying, it's not the time. Um, at this same time, right, uh, there was a woman named Safina who was also one of the children who was also trying to get out. And basically, he would he would drive her. She would say, hey, I want out. And he would say, well, I'll take you to make sure you're safe. And then on the journey, he would pull over on the side of the road at ask her if this is sure this is what she wanted to do what would you do if it was just me and you call back <laughs> call back bitches landon will laugh at that if he watches this back <laughs> and that's that's how you do a well-timed joke so yeah. <laughs> yeah and so she would say yeah this is what i want to do and he would stab her in the fucking stomach man um so he would go on and he would treat her wounds but then he would ban her from communication with the other girls. So once again, like I had said, he all he has to do is snap his finger, say, you guys are not allowed to talk to this person. And they would, in a sense, excommunicate you. Uh, and, and they did. Uh, Safina pretty much had to live in silence. Um, so once again, um, they had to move. And a lot of the boys at this point were old enough and had wanted to start their own lives and careers that they said, hey, we're not moving. Like, this is where our life is. We've moved all over. We've been all over the country at this point. We've been in Texas. We've been in California. We're, we're tired of running. We're tired of moving. And because Marcus didn't give a fuck about the boys, of course, he said, okay, fellas, you guys don't have to come along. But for the first two years of your freedom, you have to send me your checks from work. And so they Might would well be a slave. <laughs> so they would for, for the first two years, they would send him their checks. Right. So once again, um, around this same time period, uh, the Waco incident, which we'll be talking about soon, would take place. And of course, Marcus Wesson was a huge fan of David Koresh. He would go on to say that both of the men made children for God. Because of course he would. Mm -hmm. I fucking, this is what's wrong with cults, is yeah. that they hide behind shenanigans by saying, well, God told me to do it. And I'm people believe them. <laughs> so, um, similar to Koresh, right? He would basically build his family's own house at this point. Um, in 2001, Ruby had escaped again. And this time, right, she wouldn't come back. She was free. Um, Sophina would also begin having an affair. Um, she tried to leave but was tracked down by Marcus. And it was not a good time because he had learned that she was pregnant with an outsider's child. And that meant that she was completely booted out. So in a sense, she did get what she always wanted. She was liberated. Um, he did this because he said she was a bad influence. But like didn't the boys... She, didn't he you know, asked her, like, oh, can I have the child? <laughs> yes, he did. He tried to negotiate with her. He wanted the child. And she said, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. And he mm -hmm. said, well, then you have to send me your first two years of checks. Oh, no. <laughs> 
It's all about the money. <laughs> I Damn, here's the thing, man. Money. Marcus is all about the money. I mean, this but the fucking thing guy. Is, he was in debt. He couldn't pay off that. No, 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 no. That and that's the whole thing here, right? Is that literally he couldn't pay to live on a burnt building. This building that they had put this property they had burnt had burnt down. And what would later happen is, is they would get evicted again because they weren't they weren't like building it up as quickly as the city wanted them to. So they got booted out again. And and here's the thing, right? You have a small clan of people. There were at least 30 people at its height, right? How, how do you move that many people? I, I imagine it's like fucking that home alone too. where you, you're going to leave. Somebody's <laughs> going to get lost. Um, so, but with that many paychecks coming in, like, how yeah. can you not keep up? <laughs> so, um, around the same time he would purchase this home, he would also purchase a bus, a limousine, <laughs> and yes. 10 caskets that the children would use for beds. <laughs> Here's that's the where you get the vampire. <laughs> here's the part of the story where it gets sort of bleak in hindsight. Because he bought ten caskets, and in a sense, nine of the ten would be filled within the year. Uh what a fucking bummer that is, Sonia. To uh to think if about if I see that on a bus, bye. <laughs> yeah, if I see <laughs> caskets on a bus. So you what would later happen is like I said, the, the, the city itself would be upset um that they weren't building up as fast to, as they should. Well they weren't allowed to have the bus on the parking lot either. And yeah, they also had had the limousine and the bus just chilling. So what they ended up doing was basically taking all of their resources and turning the bus into like a home so it became like their mobile home operation station um with the beds on the top <laughs> so um at this point ruby and safina had both gotten in contact with each other so these are once again the two daughter sister brothers who had escaped and they were basically saying like hey we need to help our brothers sisters children cousins what the fuck is happening we need to get these kids out of there mm -hmm. and they had gone around and talked to their other family members who knew that marcus was a monster and basically had put a plan in place and what the plan was originally supposed to consist of is they were going to show up with their family members and demand, hey, we want our children. And the reason that they were legally able to do this is because on the on the children's birth certificates, Marcus was not marked as the father. So legally, they had the only parental rights. And so men in the family had said, hey, like, we'll go with you and we'll make sure you get these kids. And the women didn't want to start a war. So they pretty much said, all right, let's simmer that down. But what we need you to do is call the police for us because this isn't going to go well. So the women show up and they basically say, listen, the cops are already on their way. These are the birth certificates. We're taking our kids. And this is when this is a real fucking bummer, man. They would take Ruby and, and, and uh, Safina into the the home. The police would get there. The police would say, hey, you need to give up your kids. And police would lead those who were being held captive out. But in a back room, uh, there were some gruesome happenings going on, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, Marcus, uh, had killed nine people, nine of his kids. And, um, this was in a back room. He had shot them each in the eye. Um, they were all killed and he would be put on trial later. He would plead not guilty. Uh, he would claim that he wasn't the person who pulled the trigger. Um, that he wasn't the person who did this. Um, he would claim that his daughter, Sabrina, is the one who did it. 
And the gun was underneath her body. Yeah, the issue was is is like she was also shot through the eye. Yeah. And ballistics and you experts can't do that on yourself. Ballistic experts basically said, like, hey, we don't ten people were in that room, nine uh, one person walked away. Like you you like you shot yourself in the eye and then somehow yeah. the gun ended up like yeah. underneath you. Like um, how is that so, possible? So during the trial, um, many of the family members would talk about the abuse that they faced, um, and that would all go against Marcus. Marcus would be facing nine counts of murder, several counts of, of rape, incest, assault, and battery, and there was a whole trial here, and they pretty much knew he wasn't going to win. So, he was supposed to be on death row, but then the judge decided to make it life sentence. Well, it wasn't the judge. So what happened was, is he was originally set for, uh, for death in California. This was in 2005. Well, in 2019, uh, California state law basically declared anyone who was on the, the death have to be taken off and moved to something else and so most of them were moved to life uh without parole so um for those of you who are curious uh marcus is now 77 years old um the unfortunate thing about this case is that even after all of the struggles that many of his children had gone through many of them do still defend him as being a great father and a great person they do still defend him as being right. Um, many of them do still talk about how, you know, he was great to them. The other children um, have to undergo, like, severe therapy. And they're doing a lot better. But, I mean, they, they were raised in a very fucked up life. And, you know, I think that that's... that's if there's one silver lining right about this story, it's that like you can be in a fucked up environment that's that bad and still overcome it. Like your your mother is your sister and you still overcome that kind of struggle. I think that that says a lot about the the people who you know did choose to fix their lives and get on the right track and i mean unfortunately right on the other side of the token the family members who still believe that he was a great guy right it just goes to show just how deep um manipulation can go sometimes he was convincing to them. he was convincing to them and and um convincing to a lot of people i mean i'm sure if i searched the internet long enough I would find a Twitter group somewhere of people who were all on board with the the, the Bible of of Marcus <laughs> Wesson. Yeah. So, Sonia, what are your thoughts? Not final thoughts, but your thoughts on the story as a whole. It's disgusting, disturbing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, that's the thing with cults. Look, we're going to be discussing a lot more of these stories over the next <laughs> month. It's going to get pretty gruesome, everyone. So I need you to strap in. But as I said to Sonia before we started, I, I do promise her and Landon that after we finish some of these topics that I want to make sure we go over, once we start getting a little bit more um, audience, once we get the ball rolling a little bit more because it's the holiday season and, and there is always going to be a downtime with programming. Right. I want to, I want to maybe do some stories that are a little less <laughs> intense. I mean, bring I can't promise tuggies. fun. Yeah. We'll bring, bring the tuggies. Look, I can't promise it's going to be fun because we're a true crime show. Uh, but what I can promise is that we're going to do shows that aren't going to make you, you know, think so hard about, you're not going to be having inner monologues after we do these shows, hopefully. Um, but with that, Sonia, uh, we made impeccable time, really. We, we, we're, it's about, we're about 30 minutes in, and I think it's time for us to uh, call it a quit uh, and, and, and go home for the night. Sonia, what are your final thoughts? You always have something long, intricate written out, uh, like a fucking no. creep. Nothing, nothing written out this week? 
No, I do have it. Oh, no matter there what the situation is, close your eyes and think of all the things in your life you could be grateful for right now. Every time a bell rings, <laughs> it hates you. I love the way that Sonia will talk this whole show like a normal person. And then Sonia does her reading voice and she becomes customer service Sonia. Hi, how may I take your order? Oh, this is this is Sonia. Sonia is one of the best parts of this show. She's one of the more underrated parts of this show. Um, we're glad to have you, Sonia. We're glad to have you. Go ahead, repeat your repeat your quote, because I wasn't listening at all. Oh, of course you were. <laughs> no matter what the situation is, close your eyes and think of all the things in your life you could be grateful for right now. There you go. That's a good quote. That reminds me of the time I had a teacher in high school run over a box of kittens. Oh and in and, and class, she did it on accident. It was an accident. Jesus. But in class, because we had heard about it in class, a bunch of my classmates started meowing at her. Oh. And she sat in the front of the class. She goes, patience, patience. <laughs> it looked like something out of one of those goddamn animes. I thought this bitch was about to transcend. Yeah. And kick everybody's ass. Um but, but no, that's that's a or very nice Dragon point. Ball Z. Yeah, she dra <laughs> next time on Dragon Ball Z. No, it was uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we really did. We with that poor lady. She was a nice lady though. Shout outs to you, Miss Baron. Um why are you having nightmares still? <laughs> oh, it was such a sad listen. I remember being very sad about because they were she, she was such too. a nice lady, but I mean she was she was very uh, strange in a sense, and like you know, people like to pick on weird people. It just sort of is yeah, what it is. <laughs> and she was very much a strange individual. Um, but well, but she was. Patience. <laughs> that's what she. That's what she did. Patience. Patience. Her eyes are shut. And like, I swear to God, I thought this bitch was about to kill She's us all. Blow up. <laughs> I thought. I thought we were about to, you know, die. I. I saw God that day. Um. <laughs> I think, you know, I think the moral of this story and my final thoughts are no matter uh, what you come from, you can make something of yourself. You know, your your past does not dictate your future. Uh, I do believe full heartedly that people do change. I do believe full heartedly that um, some people aren't given a fair shake due to their pasts. Um, and I think we should all just try to be a little bit better to people, but let's also try to be more observant of, uh, the creepy fucked up shit that's going on around us. Uh, you know, if you're, uh, if your creepy uncle makes your kids uncomfortable at Thanksgiving, maybe don't invite that don't creepy uncle. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe let's not invite creepy uncle over next year for Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, let's not just tell our daughters, oh, well, you need to go put on a sweatshirt because uncle Kevin's coming over. Maybe let's boot uncle Kevin the, the, out of the group here. Maybe, maybe don't let's, <laughs> maybe let's kick uncle Kevin out of the house, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, those are my, my takeaways for this week. Sonia. Yes. Was it a better show than you expected? It was good. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad. Without uh, Landon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See Landon. Fuck you. We do a better show. No, no. I need you, Landon. I need you. Uh, well, we should next week, assuming that Landon's home, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll probably be talking. It'll be a long show, which I do need to discuss with everyone. If we're going to do one long show, yeah. if we're going to do two small shows, because Hot we're going to, <laughs> we're going to, yeah. Yeah. That, th this show coming up is going to be the first show that I think I'm going to actually go and like promote heavily, uh, because we'll be talking about Ruby Ridge and Waco and both of those incidents. And so this is like a super show because there's elements of true crime. There's elements of, politics there may even be elements of the supernatural somewhere i mean fuck i'm sure somebody <laughs> landon, has a story some, <laughs> landon has some sort of ghostly conspiracy um so yes uh next week's show is going to be a big one conspiracy theory people are going to like it political people are probably going to be all angry at my point of view uh but, but, <laughs> but we'll we'll just have to see here and do the show sonia i assume that you may skip this one but i don't know no, I'll be here. <laughs> you think you'll be here? I'll be here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm I'm amazed. See, because sometimes <laughs> the more serious ones, you you like to not be there because like they, they get they get a little heavy, and I understand that, you know. Uh, well, Sonia says she'll be here, so if she changes her mind, she's lying to you, not to me. Um, <laughs> 
sorry in advance. <laughs> but with that, everyone, I think it's time for us to bring the show to a close. Um, thank you all. No one tuned in live today, Sonia, but I'm sure a couple of them will <laughs> tune in after. Well, it's because they didn't see Landon and that pretty bald head. And now, like I said, everyone who watches frequently, they're pretty busy tonight. But uh, at any rate, it's been a hell of a show. Thank you, everyone who may watch in the future. Landon, go fuck yourself.